Uh, welcome. Uh, we'll have now Philip Kern and Adam Barrett. They are the stable release managers, and they'll, they'll talk about the stable release management. Please welcome them. So, hello everyone. Um, we wanted to talk about um, how we are currently managing stable, um, some upcoming updates to how it might be managed in the future, some proposals, how volatile will be handled or hopefully will be handled in the future. So the agenda is to talk about a bit about what's stable release management in general, what are we doing, um, what's the output of it, what are the tools we use, how can the random developer look at what we are doing and how we are doing. The second thing are point release intervals, what we are planning on doing for Squeez, what we plan to do for Lenny and Edge, um, which might or might not have been worked out that well about policies, what can go into stable update-wise, and then I hope that you have questions and comments about how we can do it better or how we can do it differently than we are doing it before, because we try to be open-minded on it. If there's something we can do to improve stable, and especially from a user's perspective, we don't always know what users expect from stable, so it's interesting to know what people is expect from us. So the first thing is, what are we actually doing? Um, we are updating stable, which means that there are certain um, defined dates where we copy over packages from a suite called proposed updates into stable proper. This also means at this point uh, we are pushing packages that are not security updates out to the users. It also means we are building new CDs people can use to install from, DVDs and other installation media. So what we do to prepare it is to review security advisories, actually look at the diff. Um, most are accepted as is though, and then review other fixes targeted to stable, which means requests we get on Debian release at least, or which are directly uploaded to the PU and UQ, which should have landed on the list before. Um, and for the actual point release, we prepare an announcement, which people can see on Debian Announce and on the website. We coordinate with the stable kernel team um, to get the kernel updated. We coordinate with the Debian installer team to get the recent fixes into Debian installer and maybe roll a new Debian installer release into stable. And then it's mainly to contact the various teams that are involved in the point release, which are FTP masters, press team, security team, and CT team, to set a date um, when to do it, because it's quite an act. It requires many people to be present, and that sometimes involves quite a bit of management. Um, of course, when we are accepting updates and to proposed updates, we also have to be sure that we have all builds available um, for all architectures, that no architecture falls actually behind. So we are mostly closing it some week or two before the point release to ensure that we have all builds available. And the same is, of course, for old stable when it's still in the archive. So what's proposed updates? Um, some people didn't seem to know back then that the suite is nowadays um, reviewed. Every package that isn't proposed updates has been reviewed by us. There's a separate new queue for it, um, which means that we are actually looking at what we're accepting and it's not random stuff some maintainer decided to upload. Um, and we're actually telling DAC to accept it at some point. Yeah. Yeah, I will come to that later. So what are we actually using for managing this is a queue viewer that's running on release.debian.org, it's even linked from there, which creates as adaptive against the current version, which means either the stable version or the proposed updates one, 
which also does automated checks for version and installability problems to ensure that we don't create uninstallabilities in stable because we don't have something like Brittany ensuring it for us. We are, of course, tracking missing builds, and that tool also helps us to create the point release announcements. Um, and it also lists to-do items. So I have opened it here for people who wonder about that. It's actually reachable from the release.debian.org site on useful links. Um, so you can see to-do items, what's still left to do for the, release, uh, for the point release, some packages that were not yet accepted, interproposed updates together with the corresponding diffs and problems and missing builds if uh, it's the case, and the ones that will, be part, will probably be part of the next stable release. There are sometimes cases where some packages that are not ready yet are skipped. That's mainly due to the fact that Packages that are not security announcements are auto-built in proposed updates, which means that for them getting built, we need to accept them. And if they are not up to date at the point release time, we need to skip them to have them actually in sync. So what's, what I am really curious about is who is using proposed updates? Who's using stable? Oh. So very few use proposed updates. Um, I was told at one point. So way, way back when, it was probably years ago at this point, um, we was told that that was back before you had proposed updates new. And there used to be all sorts of random cruft that would show up in proposed updates and then sometimes disappear again. Uh, so for the systems on which they run stable and therefore proposed updates would be interesting, we, can't, we didn't want to have that cruft appearing and disappearing. So now that I know that you've, you're, you're checking every package that goes into it, then that makes it much easier for us to start using it on a wider basis so that we can test updates for you and let you know if they don't work. Yeah. Uh, so I mean, now I have an action item as soon as I get back to Stanford to go look at uh, pointing all of our test dev systems that are running stable and add proposed updates to the sources list. That would be cool because we are not really sure who's actually testing the things in proposed updates. We really hope that they don't break anything. Um, that's why we review it after all and we do some tests on them. But in general it would help if more people that can afford it, which means that it's not a, really, a machine that needs to be really, really stable, to activate it and report back if there are any problems. Well, you already re almost replied to my question, but uh, I'm supposed to use proposed updates on production no. machines? No. So I'm, I need I'm, to have yeah. a testing, uh, I mean, a system that I can use for testing, right? So this yeah. may, may not uncover all the possible problems, actually. Right. True, true. So that's yeah. Well, it's basic update testing or upgrade testing and testing if the result still works. The problem is, um, if it's not done, it might happen that it get that it gets copied into stable, and at that point we cannot can, sorry, we cannot easily update it currently. So it would really help us. I'm talking to developers here, so it's um, also common that they have something to test with. But for really production machines. It does make sense not to enable it, yeah. Any more remarks about you think how we could possibly test them? Because for us it's some, yeah. You said you do some installability testing and I'm wondering uh, what you're using for that. Installability is mainly either a step check. Okay. Uh, what about something like uh, PU parts? We could try that. What I heard about PU parts is that some packages fail on it, which is also the case in Unstable, and that it's pretty hard to get a bug distilled out of it. That's at least what Lucas said. But on the other hand, I think uh, he also either wrote or got a tool that does installability testing, which he uses for Unstable and for Lenny to 
testing upgrades that might be more useful, and I think we will look into that. That will, of course, catch the, the obvious installability problems. It won't catch anything that depends on the runtime of the program or the actual patch if it's not to the Debian packaging. Yeah, so it's a bit about the QA of proposed updates we're wondering about, and maybe at some point we can get to, to a state where people could report that they have actually tested it. Currently, we are mostly relying on the maintainer testing it properly, or the security team for that matter, for those which come through security. Yeah. Uh, how do you want to receive reports, and is there a, a tag or something we can use in the BTS for this? Or, like, if we are running these uh, proposed updates and we run into problems, how, how should we report them? You can report them to the BTS. Normally, they would, of course, um, be attached to the package, and we would appreciate a CC, which is mostly enough for us to keep track of it. So we see that there's actually an issue in stable. Just make sure it's a version in stable, and it mentions that it's actually in stable. You're seeing that bug. Are you interested in using effectsrelease.debian.org on bugs that are filed against the package? as a way of getting it to show up in your bug list? Again, please. So the BTS supports effects, which yeah. lets it list a bug in multiple packages. Do you want us to say that it affects release.debian.org if it affects a proposed updates package? I think that would be nice, yeah. If the BTS supports that for non-version packages, yes. I think it does. OK. Yeah. I guess I will note that. <laughs> OK, so that was the stable release management and general part. I guess we can do questions on that later if there are any. Um, the next point would be point release intervals. We are currently looking at doing stable updates every two months and old stable updates every four months. So that doesn't currently apply. And we screwed a bit up with Edge being released a bit too late, um, actually the fixes that people pushed in after the Lenny release um, were delayed until Edge was end of life, which wasn't really great. And we are working on improving that by setting up a timeline when we actually intend to do the releases. Um, it might be that point releases could be more frequent immediately after Squeeze is released, which is also what fits with um, the past history. An interesting part is when you look at the Woody release, which is very old, uh, there were point releases every other year. No, sorry, every year. So this should still uh, improve the situation. And of course, we have to ensure that we're not doing two point releases at the same time, um, or doing a point release and a release at the same time, like we did with Ledge and Lenny and Edge, um, that messed up the CD team's infrastructure a bit. So that's the thing, what are we doing in between those point releases? So there's testing, uh, sorry, stable proposed updates. There's also volatile. So there are some packages which require timely updates besides the, besides the normal point release schedule that are not security updates. One thing is TSET data, which ships time zone information. Um, some countries actually think of introducing daylight saving changes one week before they actually do it, like Argentina. So it might make sense to push that earlier and not, and it's not a security update, so it's not appropriate to use security on that. And there's this other package, some people disagree with its use, but which is still used by quite some people, which is Clam AV. Um, this package is interesting in that it does, or well, did in the past bump its ABI on bug fix releases because upstream thought it would be a great idea to bump API on bug fix releases. And sometimes they also deactivate new uh, older versions through their signatures. So we do have to address this in some way, which we currently did through Volatile. And then there were also things that led to the introduction of volatile sloppy back then, 
which were um, Pigeon and Lip Purple updates to cope with instant messaging protocol changes like ICQ. And I think for MSN, a security update even deactivated the whole protocol. So we also need to address this in some way to keep stable usable. So to get back a bit why Volatile was introduced, at least as I could find it, because it was made uh, at the Sarge release, I think. Volatile proper was a set of packages everyone can basically update to, which means ClamAV data was mentioned back then, and TSET data, which are safe to upgrade. <coughs> now, ClamAV data is something we are going to phase out because there are some concerns with it being built automatically and signed automatically and uploaded automatically. Um, and there are other ways with proxies to handle this specific issue. Um, volatile sloppy, which we currently don't really use, was introduced for packages that actually need larger version bumps to get useful again, which was the, I guess, a no mm -hmm. AM client. Um, that needed this. So what was done back then was a separate team and a separate infrastructure with its own archive host to be run completely separate from everything else. So what we have now with Volatile is that it's run by a single person. It uses an ancient DAC version that has no support for ver uh, source version 3. Now granted the security archive has the same problem, but we hope to get that solved. Or well. The FTP masters have to solve it. Um, and currently there's no easy ability to copy over volatile builds into proposed updates, which would make sense for TSET data because we want to push that into stable anyway. Uh, the only relief is that the mirroring is actually handled by the same people that mirror FTP master. So a burden less because we had a whole unofficial mirroring network for volatile with hosts that are not the official ones, so yeah, it was a bit tricky. So the proposal is actually to run it on the normal infrastructure, which means on FTP master. Some work has been already done on this. It's just not exported into, uh, or onto the mirrors yet. And then use it as a suit to pass updates more quickly to the users and point releases can. If it's called updates, like on other distributions or volatile is basically a bike shed issue. Um, we will see what we do about that, but we will encourage users to activate it by default, which is, I think, also what Debian installer does. And then copy into volatile from proposed updates, and the volatile bits will also be installed into stable at point release time. The goal is, of course, to keep stable as usable as possible, this does mean for some packages that we will integrate new upstream versions into stable. But I will come to that later. So now that's a bit of a topic switch. So I guess there are some people who remember the old rules for stable updates, what has to be fulfilled for a stable update to be accepted, which was codified in an interesting way. So basically it said, if you fix a security problem, you need to go to the security team, the security team needs to accept it and do an advisory for it. Then it's accepted into stable. Nowadays we have the problem that the security team for some security issues doesn't deem it critical enough to um, publish an own advisory and point the people to us so that we push it through a regular point release, which is basically shifting the workload, but, well, we have to cope with that. Um, then, if the package fixes a critical bug which can lead to data loss, data corruption, or an overly broken system, or the package is broken or not usable anymore. Right, we are also currently opting to accept a bit less critical bugs that are still affecting users and annoying user to some degree. Um, yeah, that's a bit about the stable version not being installable, which obviously needs to be fixed. 
and the bits about the released architectures that have to be in sync, and or it basically gets all architectures back in sync, which is what we do if we usually notice if things are out of date, um, introduced by some updates, and maybe scheduled in an use or something. This has happened in the past. So there was this rule, um, what needs to be fulfilled for it to be accepted. And there was also the bit packages which will most probably be rejected. Packages that fix non-critical bugs. Um, packages that fix an unusable minor part of a package. So what we are now settling for is a bit different. Um, of course, we still let in most of the security advisories unless we really know they are broken. And what's likely to be acceptable is if you fix a security issue or fix a bug of at least severity important or fix an installability in FTBFS bug or bring architectures back in sync. So FTPFS bugs also weren't fixed in a stable release, but it makes sense that the security team is actually able to recompile it for their updates, so we also accept those bugs. Then we try to apply common sense on those updates. I mean, we are also involved in testing updates, so we regularly review code, and mostly you can see if a change is mostly sane or not. Um, it, of course, makes sense to have minimal diffs to review because it makes our life much easier. Um, then, yeah, it's still the case that if we update a package, it must have a reason, of course. So it's not that the wish list bug of your choice can be fixed and stable because we don't want to risk to break anything. So if there's a stable package, it should get fixed, and you're, for example, the maintainer of it, don't hesitate to contact us if you think that issue should really be fixed and stable. Normally, with common sense, we can see if it warrants an update or not. So there are some packages that will get newer upstream versions. We settled with that in the past. This is probably not an exhaustive list. I don't know what will happen in Squeeze, but what we did is post QL, I still don't know how to pronounce it properly, uh, which gets newer bug fix releases because we trust upstream not to screw it up. That's actually Martin Pitt working on it most of the time. ClamAV, as I already said, TZ data is also basically upstream releases. And the Mozilla related packages that are also push through security as new upstream versions because it's unfeasible to actually backport the security fixes. There's still a problem though, how to tag packages of which we know that they get larger updates. There are some mechanism currently in use, nobody knows of, I guess, I guess nobody in this room, that is step tags used for limited support tags and unsupported tags um, with relation to security. Does anybody know that packages are tagged like that? One person, interesting. So there's, there was a tool planned when this was introduced to actually list the packages you have installed that are unsupported, which got never implemented. So it's basically tagged through the security tracker. Nobody gets, well, sometimes when it's during a release cycle, it's announced, of course, on the security list but there are also some packages for which are affected, uh, which will go, might go in into a release which are not supported. So that's kind of a similar case we should solve in the near future to actually get the information to people. So I would really like to know what you are expecting from stable. It is, of course, hard to get we had the edge and the half thing um, for the drivers updates. Those are, of course, a bit harder and mainly rely on people doing the work, which we currently lack, I suppose, for this, and backporting stuff into the kernel. What's, what was done for Lenny was backports of some drivers into the Lenny kernel um, instead of a full and a half release, but 
it would be interesting to know what the issues are you are having with stable. Yeah. You're currently the only one. So um, I will say that, that I'm, I'm torn. Um, the etch and a half release from the perspective of a stable user was nice to get the driver, to get more driver updates than can be reasonably backported. And we missed that a little bit with Lenny in that we have some new Dell servers for right. which we're running the backports kernel because the firmware for something or other was just not available in the Lenny kernel. Um, but that being said, from a package maintainer perspective, uh, the etch and a half kernel was really hard because there's actually a whole bunch of out-of-tree kernel modules right. in Debian, and almost none of them got rebuilt for etch and a half, which meant, I mean, and I, I mean, I have one of them, uh, OpenAFS, and the way that the kernel development tends to work, and then the way that upstream on those out-of-tree modules tends to work, um, the you're going to need significantly newer upstream releases right. of the out-of-tree kernel module in order to work with the new version of the kernel, and it all turns into a big mess. Um, so. You know, I think it, it, it provides a more consistent, stable experience to not have um, that etch and a half style release. But I do think we should realize that when we go that route, that means that some of our users will have to use the backboards kernel. Right, right. Um, I mean, there's also the issue of X drivers, where I don't know how much is currently backports or if at all. I don't. I don't. I don't either. Um, I mean, I we mostly use stable on servers. I actually run right. testing and unstable on desktops. So, right. I yeah, that's something we need to address at some point. I mean, out of three modules, if the maintainers would actually bother to somehow provide a co-installable version of it or tell us what to rebuild, it might work, but. Of course, you need new upstream versions. And well, with OpenAFS, the problem is, is that it's, it's a whole lot of software. Yeah. There's a user space and a kernel thing, and, yeah. and, and you know, it gets really hard. I mean, one hope is that maybe that kernel version gets more back parts, but um, then it also depends on the maintainers doing them, probably, or fetching the patch somewhere. Um, we didn't settle for anything yet for squeeze. We just said we won't do it for Lenny. Any other questions? Any other needs you have? Any concerns you have about what we are doing? Did we actually manage to break your system already or break it? Uh, first, I wanted to say thank you for uh, helping to keep stable usable. I, I use it in a lot of places. And uh, one of the things I find is as time goes on, I end up uh, backporting more and more uh, packages mm -hmm. and uploading those to backports. Um, one thing that I had heard about a while back, but I don't know the status of, and, and maybe this is relevant to the work you're doing, um, I think uh, Dpackage to LibDepths was going to be made to be more intelligent about how it determined dependencies um, such that it minimized dependencies so that you might actually be able to use packages from, from testing and unstable on top of stable if all they depended on was a an older libc or, or something like that. Does that help you out at all with, with stable proposed updates to, uh, to just be able to pull things in faster? Mm, not currently, because we don't have a technical ability to p actually pull things from there unless at the point release time where we sometimes manage to push p versions up in the tree, which means push some things from stable to testing and unstable because they weren't updated there yet. Um, the other way around only happened on Debian Archive Keyring, I think, where th something was control suited into uh, stable directly. Currently, it doesn't help us. I mean, you see many build logs where it tells that uh, the dependency is actually useless, but the program links against it. Um, I guess you're referring to simple files. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I guess that's just a matter of fixing packages in the archive to allow for that before that will be there useful. There are also some packages that call, that's now from a testing point of view, uh, dh make sh libs uh, dash big v, which causes packages to have an sh libs that matches with the current upstream version of the package. Those are really <laughs> annoying because 
it's just guessing if there are new symbols at that point. So symbol files would help with that from a testing point of view, and that would help significantly on um, migrations. From the stable point of view, there's not that much currently we can do. We could do installability checks, but then you're stuck with testing all architectures if they picked up similar uh, dependencies and then putting it in, which might work, but then you might have to bin and immune some of them, so it's not really easy at that point. Well, and you guys still have to review all the changes no matter what anyway, so yeah. it would just maybe speed things up a little bit. But Yeah, actually, if you could, can take the patch and just do an appropriate version number into proposed updates, that also works well. If you have to review it anyway, okay, it gets rebuilt, but that's the price we pay. Right. Um, so I use Volatile in my stable boxes, and so also thank you. Um, uh, Climb AV is a lifesaver. Uh, I was just curious what your philosophy was on actually, I guess, putting more stuff in there. I mean, I, I think about if we're talking about content and not code, um, things like uh, CA certificates, and things like, like that. Like what? CA certificates, so you can get fresh uh, right. CA certs on right. the box. Um, just curious. Some of those things are would be seems like seem like they could be useful, but maybe I'm not seeing the whole picture. That's certainly useful. The problem with CA certificates is that its packaging is fragile, to say the least. So, right. so, so perhaps it could be split into. Yeah, it should, it should actually be split, and there should actually be a sane solution that all packages use the same certificates instead of Mozilla using its own certificate store, Java updating it from CA certificates, Conqueror using an own certificate store. Yeah, I agree on that. There's some infrastructure that should be done on PKI. It would be an obvious candidate if it wouldn't be that fragile. And I think we did one update of CA certificates for Volatile. Actually, yeah, that seems to ring a bell. But, but it, the general philosophy of, I mean, some packages are really just content. Um, Which ones? That well, would be interesting to know. I mean, ClamAV data is a pretty special case, but. Well, I, I'm thinking about ISO codes, which we are maintaining, right. which is basically content. And I think the package is correct. <laughs> What's um, using that data? I think that the GNOME is using that data. Okay. Uh, we have some input from them, so I think that we merely don't know who is using that data. It would need to check the dependencies, actually. I mean, if, especially if users request an update of such data packages, uh, or developers for that matter, we can do that. Um, they seem to be little risk at that point, but yeah, there needs to be some use to it, of course. I mean, with these data, it's on some instances pretty critical to have current time zone data. I don't, wouldn't mind such an update. Yeah. Mostly the content of ISO code, for instance, is made of translations. So that brings another topic. It could be interesting. How about some uh, updates to localization stuff for stable, if that happens to be doable without upgrading to a new upstream version, for instance? Right, so are you referring to simple translations or to DEPCONF translations? Actually, I, I think none of, none of them are doable with uh, what we currently have and how the, package, uh, yeah. the packaging is, is done. Uh, that was the idea lying under the TDEB uh, proposal, right. but right. nothing is ready for, for either squeeze or squeeze plus one or whatever. I this think is just ideas popping that, in my yeah. mind that things that could be easily, as soon as the infrastructure is ready for that, uh, updated for, for stable release. What we're currently doing is <coughs> accepting some translation updates when the package is updated anyway. Um, so if there's a bug to fix and you can also, then you, if you ask us, you can also yeah. squeeze translation There's updates. There's a bug fix and there are some yeah. DEPCOM translation, yeah. for yeah. instance, yeah. Then, then that would be acceptable for yeah. uh, an update, okay. In the general case, we don't have the infrastructure to do it for all packages. 
Um, I have a, a minor bit of almost bike shedding, but not quite. Um, so um, historically, we've not had a particularly well communicated, standardized, written down uh, standard for versioning your uploads to proposed updates. Um, and in the but and currently we're basically using sweet names now, mostly appended with a plus, uh, um, or prepended with a plus. Um, the problem with the sweet names, of course, is that they don't guarantee a sort order. And if we when we go to squeeze, now they're really not going to guarantee a sort order because S is kind of late in the alphabet. Maybe it's time to switch to version numbers now that we have a stable yeah. versioning number policy because it used to be that we weren't sure what version number the next release was going to be, but now we I think we decide we're always going to increment the major number. We can of course communicate such a policy. Um, indeed, it's nice that Squeeze is larger than Lenny. <laughs> and Edge was uh, less than Lenny, so it actually worked for those three. three. Um, basically, it's when what we currently use, uh, if it's the testing or unstable version basically backported because it's just a maintainer upload and an MU in between, then we use tilde um, suit name currently, and we use plus if you add patches. Sometimes it even gives collisions with the security team, so... And old style bin and MUs in stable, which we love. Old style bin and MUs are pain. Because, <laughs> yeah, because x.0.1 sorts higher than x plus Lenny 1. Right, so <laughs> thankfully... Sucks, sorry. Sorry, I interrupted you. Uh, so thankfully, I think bin and use are now using um, are, are now using uh, plus B uniformly, um, which means that all we if we sort out between stable updates and security updates, either coordinate using the same version number, or um, uh, give stable give security something probably that sorts earlier than what's than the stable updates. But it's it, probably easier to coordinate the same version number because you guys mix. I mean, sometimes sta sometimes proposed updates is newer, and sometimes stable, sometimes security is newer, and it kind of trades <laughs> back and forth. It's a little bit hard. Um, but yeah, if we can sort that all out, but give all of that stuff something that sorts after bin MUs, I think that this all starts looking more reasonable. Yeah, yeah. And I think there was a proposal that was circulated around along those lines that even included handling the bin MU of a stable update case and the whole thing. So. Um, maybe we could, but mostly I mean, they were good ideas. They seemed to solve all the problems, but we never declared one of them as official, um, and therefore right. no one knew to follow it. So I think it seems like now is a good time to, to kind of do that. Right. So I will note this down that we need to solve this. Um, actually, what security does, if there's an update in proposed updates, they usually merge it in. So you can actually get proposed updates sometimes earlier than a point release, but okay. that's mainly to save work on one side of the yeah. pond. All right. So we still have time left, but it doesn't really seem like questions, and I see also looks like, oh, there's a tall package. Right, that's also a package that needs updates to still provide anonym anonymous access to a network. Um, I could imagine updates to that, to be honest, but we would need to be contacted by the maintainers mm. about it. Didn't we actually fix the specific issue, the key rollover one? I'm fairly sure we did. I think we... I know Weasel wanted to upload packages. Indeed. I'm fairly sure we did fix that specific one. I think so too, but... In general, the top people are also folks that want to get newer upstream versions in for strong anonymous access, whatever. So, yeah, if we are approached, we might be open to that. So, There's a question earlier on there um, about, uh, so can we expect more priority important bugs to be fixed and stable? Um, some maintainers don't seem to have much interest in that. Um, I, mean, I, I can offer my opinion, which is I think it's going to depend a lot on the maintainer because yeah, it can be it a fair amount of work uh, to backport an important bug fix to the stable version. I mean, I know I feel kind of guilty because DSA actually asked me to do that for one of my packages, and I just never ended up having time. Um, 
I, I mean, I, it, I've done this process and it works great. So certainly any Debian uh, package maintainer who's, uh, who didn't, wasn't aware of it, stable updates are, are, are great. And if you have a bug like that that you want to fix. I mean, there was this bug on kernel package, which basically said you cannot build kernels, I think, greater than 2635, so the current one, you can't build it on stable, and the maintainer basically said, I can't do anything about that, that's a stable release department without actually CCing us. So we didn't see that bug, and actually somebody replied, like, please contact the release team on that address, and he didn't bother to... Uh, so it really depends on the maintainer, and it's somewhat different if some random guy shows up providing a patch than the maintainer actually saying, okay, I did this, I know it works in unstable, it was tested in unstable, um, I'm pretty sure that backport will work, and then we can do it, yeah. Yeah. yeah I think I, I can confirm that we did that for Samba a few times already. I think four or five times fixing important bugs and asking for permission in some way by posting a patch, it worked very well. So I think the policy you explained about important bugs being allowed to be fixed in stable, it is already working. As yeah. far as I've seen for but some part, it's working, yeah. it's working very well. Not all maintainers know it though, despite oh, yeah, sure. it being announced we, we on need, Debian Devil. We need announced. to say it louder, it's working. <laughs> It, it, it's actually uh, sometimes more, even more reassuring than updating a package in unstable because you get all these people reviewing your patch and making sure it looks right. <laughs> we sometimes have the case that the patch in question was, oh, well, it turned out to be uploaded to unstable later, but um, yeah, it should be tested first. Yeah, if the bugs in unstable, we, in the unstable packages, we would really prefer that you have actually tested it in unstable first. And maybe some aging applied like we do for testing. Yeah. Mainly because e if it turns out to have huge issues, it's e much easier to just re-upload to unstable. Right. We have had cases in the past where people have only noticed stuff after we've released a point release. And then people have turned around and said, ah, that broke something. Which we did. Uh, UDEV. Okay. So you're all happy about stable otherwise, or not just ignoring it? <laughs> okay. Any more questions? Nothing. Oh, there's one. As long as there's time, I'll, I'll ask. Uh, the, some of the things I find myself uh, backporting the most, I still actually run a, a stable desktop, and the, okay. uh, the things that I find myself backporting um, are things where the technology is moving at a pretty fast rate. Yeah. Yeah. And so things like uh, VoIP clients like Ikaiga um, or Twinkle or, or some of these other things. Um, or even web frameworks and that kind of stuff. Yeah. Which involves In a lot of cases, yeah. there's a lot of library dependencies, and I end up backporting you know, a dozen packages or something to, uh, to make it work in order to get this new functionality. Um, but that's, you know, a lot of that's de desktop specific. Um, is that something that Volatile could address, you know, to get, you know, you mentioned uh, Ice Weasel and Ice Dove is, you know, things There's to, to a get, bit you of know, a technical people want necessity. Browsers, yeah. There's a bit of a necessity to do it there, well, yeah, and it's not new branches, and... so it's fairly, it's at least remaining in the same branch, which you probably can't say of your other software. I mean, I guess it's unavoidable for users to either use backports for some packages or, and make that official in some way and maybe also get more QA on it um, or to install them by themselves or backporting them by themselves. I don't think we want to provide a stable system, which means the basic services will all be there. They will all be supported. And if you're running a website and you need a new version of a web framework, we cannot currently cater for that in the same way, sadly. Malkin, there's a question. Right, so the question is if the volatile takeover is the only proposal or if it's going to be there for squeeze. I really won't like 
I, I really won't maintain the ancient deck anymore. So the work that has been done was creating a separate suite that we will be able to manage. Um, so I think with the help of the FTP masters, it will be doable for Squeeze. I don't know how it will be called um, and what the work on the installer will be to do it by default, but I'm pretty sure it will be there for Squeeze. <coughs> Yeah, I just wanted to uh, remind people that lack of hardware support is also considered a uh, severity important bug and also acceptable for a stable release. So if you have a case where um, you just need a new driver that's not backported or something like that, feel free to file a bug. Um, and we're definitely interested in, in enabling, enabling new servers, new desktops and stuff like that if we can without risking regressions. And that's actually the guide that most does most of the kernel stuff and stable, so. Thanks. Anything else? So thanks for your coming, and that's it.